before we get into it real quick, I want to make a couple of announcements. Next Sunday, we're starting a new series called Are We There Yet? Pastor Justin has been praying about this. It's been on his heart. It's been on his mind. So we are super excited um, about this upcoming sermon series, Are We There Yet? Make sure you join us, whether you're here in person or joining us online. And then Sunday evening, January 17th, we're doing Pizza with the Pastors. This is for people who are fairly new to the church. Maybe you've been watching the last six months and uh, you want to know more. This is your opportunity. You want to find out what's going on. You want to meet Pastor Justin. You want to talk to the staff. You want to hear where we're going, where we've been. This is your moment, Sunday, January 17th. Make sure you sign up online to reserve your spots. There we go. Let's get on with it. Man, how many of you feel, and I'm going to use this word, and it's not what I mean. How many of you feel that like a little bit holiday hangover, right? And what I mean by that is like you're full of like ham and eggnog, not like, not like other substances, but you're ready for your, you, you are glad to have seen your family, but you're ready for them to go home, right? Like, <laughs> Merry Christmas. I'll see you next holiday, right? Um, you're ready to take down the decorations, you're ready like for your house to be normal and in order. And maybe for some of us in here, there is a lingering disappointment with some of the gifts that we got. Not, not that we didn't want them, but they aren't exactly what they want. It's like you wanted an Apple Watch, but you got like the Walmart knockoff brand, right? You wanted, um, you wanted like some new shoes, but they weren't the exact same shoes. I think I've told this story before, but obviously... It has stuck with me for the past 25 years. It has scarred me. It has shaped me to the person that I am today. Uh, when I was in uh, fourth or fifth grade, I really, really, really wanted a Dallas Cowboy starter jacket. Like the 90s pullover. Yeah, I hear, yeah. So they made them all different teams, basketball, baseball, football. But I wanted the Dallas Cowboy starter jacket, the pullover that had the hood and the big pocket, right? And so Christmas morning, and my dad's here, and this is no offense to you, Dad. You raised three wonderful kids, and so <laughs> this is no, no knock to you at all. Um, but Christmas morning, I remember opening my gifts, and I opened this one gift, and there's a Dallas Cowboy star staring me in the face. And I'm like, it's a jacket. I'm getting excited. And as I'm opening it up, my little, little brain is kind of working. I'm like, something is off, right? And so I open it, and it's a big puffy jacket like George Costanza on Seinfeld, if you remember that one, right? And... Um, and uh, it, it's a zip-up jacket. I'm like, did Starter make like an exclusive zip-up jacket? Because I don't remember what's going on. And I noticed like in the little corner, it, there's an R. And it's a Russell Brand Dallas Cowboy Starter jacket. It's not a star or the Russell Brand jacket, not a Starter jacket. It was so close to what I wanted. It checked like three, like two of the three boxes. It was a Dallas Cowboy jacket, but the Starter jacket just missed the mark, right? Maybe you've experienced that too, where you want something um, but it just misses the mark. Back when we were all allowed to travel, which was like a year ago, um, my wife and I, we loved traveling. Uh, we would go on cruises. They're cheap. They're fun. You get to go see a bunch of different places. And um, if you've ever been out of the country, you notice something about the souvenir shops. They are all the exact same thing with a different like city or place on it, right? It's like, welcome to Cozumel, welcome to the Bahamas. I'm like, that's the same shirt, right? It's just a different name. And so I was always drawn to the sunglass shop, like the sunglass shop where you could get a pair of Oakleys for $10 where you could get three pair for $20, right? And it was, if you know anything about sunglasses, you cannot get Oakleys or Ray-Bans for like $7.50 a pair. That's just not how it works, right? I knew they were fake. I knew they weren't the real deal, but I would always drawn to them. And so I would like look and I would try to find the best pair that looked the most legit. And I would buy like the three for 20. And it always happened within about three to six months, all of those pair of sunglasses would either have been lost or broken, right? There's, they would not hold up. And so eventually, about four years ago, I splurged. Um, I had some extra money and I bought a pair of Oakley sunglasses, like the real deal, a pair of Oakley sunglasses. I still have those sunglasses today. I wear them every day. I know exactly where they are. I haven't lost them. I haven't misplaced them. They, there's some wear and tear, but that's what happens after four years of use. But I know where those sunglasses are. Are. There was a flip that switch, or a switch that flipped, whatever that, yeah, something like that, whatever. But something changed in my mind. Something changed when I broke down and bought the real deal. And maybe you experienced that too. 
It's like you'll go to Walmart and you'll buy like the $25 Black & Decker drill, cordless drill, and it goes out after about six months and you break down, you buy another one, you buy another one, finally like, you know what? Maybe I should buy like a legit drill. And it's like you, you t there's, there's something that happens when you, when you pay a price there's a level of care that comes with knowing and taking care of what you have because you know the cost that it took to get it. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Is anyone, yeah, I see some heads nodding, all right? There's, there's a level of care that comes when you buy the real deal. Today we're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 and 45. Um, we're going to read this passage um, right now, and we're going to read it again at the end. And... Uh, Let's get, we'll get into it. It says, Matthew, Matthew 13, verse 44. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. So this message this morning has been difficult for me to process. It's been, been difficult for me to plan and prepare for. Um, I don't know if you guys ever post anything online and like secretly in the back of your mind you have someone like that you're hoping reads it, right? It's like a passive aggressive post. And you're like, not that anyone specific, but you're like, you're hoping someone reads it, right? As I was planning this message, the person that kept coming to my mind was me. It can't, like I could not get myself out of my head, and here's, and here's the reason why. What I'm speaking on morning, this morning breaks my heart because I realize that I've been guilty of it time and time again. Being involved in, in ministry in different churches for, for a little over a decade, I've seen that the church, not just Foundation Church, but kind of the capital C, all of us as the body of Christ together, has been guilty of this. And just like the sunglasses that I bought in Mexico, I, I, I'm afraid that far too many of us have bought a fake knockoff version of Christianity and we've settled for it instead of pursuing the real deal. There's a, a, a theologian, um, minister, evangelist that was uh, alive in the, in the mid-1900s. Uh, his name's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he talked about this when he, in his book, Cost of Discipleship. He talks about cheap grace versus costly grace. And I think a lot of us in here, if we take an honest look at our lives, an honest look at our relationship with Christ, the version that we've bought has been a cheap version of grace. This is what Bonhoeffer writes. He says, cheap grace is the grace we bestow upon ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without the requiring of repentance. Baptism without, without discipline Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Basically what he is saying here is that we can throw this label of Christianity on our chest, on our lives, and then we think that is a cure-all and we can continue to live how we want. I can continue to live because, or sin because God will forgive me, right? We can put on that label, but our life doesn't look any difference. I heard this phrase several years ago, and it's a phrase that's called moralistic therapeutic deism, which makes me sound super smart, which if you know me, you're like, he doesn't know what that means. Um, and I didn't know what that meant, uh, and so I had to go look it up, and um, it, I found out kind of the, the, the basis and, and the, the origin of this term, and it was coined by a uh, sociologist in 2005, and it was, uh, he wrote this book after there was a, a research a uh, project that was done surveying and studying thousands of young Christians. And after this project was done, uh, this sociologist came to find out that a lot of these young Christians at the time, which would now be you and I's age, right? 15 years ago, with people, you know, when we were in college, when we were in high school, the people that he was talking to, which people are in the church, which are leaders in the church, which are involved in the church now, that they have this view of Christianity that treats it kind of like a buffet, where it's like, I'll take a little bit of this, and I'll take a little bit of that, but I don't like that, so I'm going to leave that over there. And so here are some of the, just kind of the high points, the, the, the key points of this view of moralistic, therapeutic deism. Um, and if some of these hit a little close to home, then maybe you've kind of bought into this line of thinking. It says that God wants people to be good or nice or fair to each other. Okay. 
God does not need to be particularly involved except when there's a problem that needs to be resolved. And the goal of Christianity is to feel happy or good while ignoring things like repentance of sin or church disciplines like reading the Bible, prayer, fasting, confession, things like that. This was done about 15 years ago, and in my time of being involved in ministry, I can say that I don't see this view as being kind of pushed out of the church, but if anything, I feel like it's taken deeper root in the mindsets of a lot of Christians, right? Following Jesus is like, I just want, God wants me to be happy. God wants me to feel good. When sin is called out, people say, well, that's who I am. That's how God made me. Hold on. Hold on. So you're able to stay a liar and follow Christ. You're able to continue to gossip and follow Christ. You're able to continue to, to look at porn and follow Christ. You're able to do, is that how this works? But when sin is called out, they say, well, you can't, like, you have to love me. God says, love God and love people. You have to love me just as I am. The Bible absolutely says that God is love. It says that in 1 John, but let's look at what else the Bible says that God is before we just start pulling out that one because it sounds good. In Hebrew 12, it says that God is a devouring fire. In 2 Samuel 22, it says God is a solid rock. In Psalm 54, it says God is my helper. In Psalm 68, it says God is a God who saves. In Job 25, God is powerful and dreadful. In Job 36, God is all-powerful. In Psalm uh, 7, God is an honest judge. And in Romans 6, 23, God is eternal life. I could keep going. So before we just start saying, pulling out one thing, God is this, can I tell you that all of those attributes flow through one thing, and that is found in a couple spots in the Bible. And as I was doing some research, I found this super, super interesting. In Isaiah chapter 6, and in Revelation chapter 4, you've got Isaiah, who has a view of heaven, and you have John, who has a revelation, that's where we got the name from, revelation of heaven, and they are both in the presence of God, and they hear these angels shouting, not God is love, not God is a devouring fire, not God is an honest judge. You know what the angels are shouting? They are shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So all these things that we want to pull and say, you can't judge me because God is love, you have to love me. You know what those things are filtered through? They're filtered through God's holiness. And so here's the thing, a, a, a life that follows Christ a life that follows Christ but doesn't evident, evidence any real change is a knockoff version. If there's no evidence of the fruit of the Spirit, if there's no love, if there's no joy, if there's no peace, if there's no patience, if there's no kindness, if there's no goodness, if there's no gentleness, if there's no faithfulness, if there's no self control, we have bought a knockoff version of Christianity. Michael, but Jesus loved people. Yeah, he loved people. Absolutely. But he didn't say to the woman that was caught in adultery, you just like to sleep around, you're good, that's how we created you, get on. No, what did he say? He said, go and sin no more. <laughs> he said, go and sin no more. We want to take the first part and ignore the second part. We want the forgiveness without the repentance. It's a cheap version of grace. It's a version that allows us to ride the fence. Say, I'm going to keep one foot on this side of living how I want, and I'm going to keep this side saying, I love Jesus. One of our goals as a church is we want to see a move of God. And, and, you know, that was like one thing. We want to see a move of God. I'm not really sure how you measure that. I don't know if it's one of those like fundraising thermometers where it's like we had this many people come and this many people did this. Like, I don't know how that's worked. But I would say that it is difficult to see a move of God until we move towards God. And I say it's difficult, not impossible, because I've heard stories of people who were strung out on drugs and had this incredible encounter with God and quit cold turkey and God changed their lives. I, I, you see in the Bible where God encountered Saul on the road to Damascus, who was on his way to persecute Christians. He wasn't like toying with the idea of Jesus. No, he was actively hunting and trying to jail and execute people that were following Jesus. And so it's obviously not impossible. God has, and he will continue to encounter and move in people's lives. But what I'm talking about are people like me, People like you who say, we, yes, we follow God, absolutely. But we don't want to pay the price that comes with that, right? We want all of the benefits without having to do any of the work. Uh, a few weeks ago, my hot water tank went out, and I did what any respectable adult male would do. I called my dad, and um, 
There you go. Uh, and I said, Dad, I think my water tank's going out. And uh, he, uh, I was FaceTiming him, so I showed him. He's like, yeah, you're going to have to get a new one. So I got the new one. Merry Christmas. Yay, that was fun. Um, and I got it out of the closet, which almost killed me. I hooked it. But as I have the new one in, I'm like, there's no, I don't know what I'm doing. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. And so my dad came over, and we got it in the closet. And then I did what I've been doing since I was seven. I held the flashlight. I was like, there it is. Yep, right there, right? Um, I was like, yeah, I think. He's like, just don't. Just You're in my light. I was like, sorry. Um, he did all the connections. He made sure the gas wasn't leaking. He made sure the water was hooked up. He made sure everything was where it was supposed to be. And when Aubrey woke up the next morning, she took a hot shower. I said, hey, do you like what we did? Do you like that we fixed the hot water tank, right? I wanted to take credit for something that I could not have done on my own, right? We want to continue to live like the rest of the world with no noticeable change in our lives, no noticeable change in our habits in the words that we use, in the way we treat people, in the way we spend our money, in the way we give our time, in the way we conduct business. We want to continue to live like we want to live, but we want to put the label Christian on it. We want forgiveness. We want heaven. We want the blessings, but we don't want to repent. We don't want to tithe. We don't want to serve. We don't want to live a life that honors God. We want the benefits, but we don't want to pay the price that comes with following Christ. Luke 9, 23 says this. This is Jesus talking to the crowd. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways and take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? Let's look at that for just a second. If any of you wants to be my follower, I think we'd all say, yeah, we want to be his follower. You must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, not once. It's not a prayer that you pray when you're seven and then you're good. No, you take up your cross daily and you follow me. When Jesus is talking to the crowd, he says something that at that time is pretty shocking, but now it sounds kind of nice. Um, when he says, pick up your cross at that time, the cross wasn't something you wear on your neck. It's not something you wear on a shirt. It's not something you buy at Hobby Lobby and hang on your wall because it's a nice accent piece, right? It's not, that wasn't what the cross was. It was a means of brutal and gruesome execution. And so as he is telling the crowd, pick up your cross daily, there is this imagery that comes in their mind from the public executions they've seen and a little bit of foreshadowing about what would happen to Jesus in a year or two. He says, pick up your cross, not once, pick up your cross daily and follow me. And he makes it pretty clear that if you pick up your cross, you can't hang on to your old life and follow him, right? It just, it just doesn't work. If you try to hang on to your old life while following him, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for his sake, you gain real life. One of our values is growing equals changing. As we continue to follow Jesus, our life should look different. Our life should look different. I pointed out those verses in Revelation and, and Isaiah where the angels are crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's who he is. Do you know what that means for us? It means that our life should pursue holiness. That's, that's like a super old school term, and maybe you're thinking, so do I have to start wearing like long denim skirts? No, it's not what that means. What that means is that your life is set apart. The word holiness means set apart for a specific use, right? When it's, when it's referring to God, it means pure. It means without blemish. It means perfect. A life of Christ, I'm going to use a weird word here, is one of sanctification where you are constantly becoming more like Jesus every day. Right? Where, where, where who you are today should look different in a year. Right, that our life is pursuing holiness. It means that your lives are being set apart for God to you. So if your life looks pretty much the same except for the alarm clock that you set on Sunday mornings, I'd say that you've bought, an, that you've bought a knockoff version of Christianity. And Jesus doesn't really pull any punches when he's talking about this phony version. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 
He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. That's a scary thought. That's a scary thought to think that we can do like, oh, I thought I did all the right stuff. I went to church. Yay. I said Jesus. I sang the songs. He's like, I don't know you. We want to be so concerned about knowing Jesus, but does Jesus know us? Or is he just a guest that comes in our life whenever it's convenient for us? I mentioned earlier that one of our goals is we want to see a move of God in the church. Right? And for me, I don't believe I'll see a move of God in my life until I say enough with the knockoff, enough with the fake, enough with this phony version of Christianity. I don't think I'll see a move of God in my life Until I say, hey, it's not about me. Stop putting myself at the center of the Bible. It's about what Jesus has done. Until I say enough of trying to hold on to my life and follow him. Until my thoughts and my words and my actions are constantly pursuing Christ. Right? Until I start living a life set apart from God for God to use. Until I start doing those things, that goal is going to be like a lot of our New Year's resolutions here in a little bit. Right? You're like, I'm going to lose that 20 pounds. March comes around, and be like, I'll stay fat for 2021. Right? That's, about, <laughs> that's, about, that's about what our, our goal of seeing a move of God is going to be like. It's going to fizzle out and be like, I'll pick it up later. Until we start doing these things, until we say, you know what, I've had enough. And I, and I keep saying we, and I want to make something very, very clear. There's nothing you or I can do to, 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 to enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing I can do. It, it is all God transforming and changing my life. And so I, I, I apologize for saying, I got to do this. I, I I, there's nothing I can do. So I want to make that very, very clear. It is God who roots that out and transforms and change my life. So if there's any confusion about that, I apologize. I just want to make that very, very clear. There is nothing that you and I can do. It is all the work of God transforming our life. Here's the thing. That initial cost to follow Jesus, to lay down your life, pick up your cross, it seems scary, it seems difficult, it seems hard, but here's the thing. Once you realize what is gained by losing it all, you realize what kind of treasure you have found. I want to read that verse again in Matthew 13, kind of in light of what we've been talking about this morning. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Now, I can count on one hand the number of times I've played the lottery. Some of you may have your own views on that, and that's fine. Um, but my chance of winning the lottery this go-around, I don't even know what it is, but it's zero. I have bought zero tickets. I don't know anyone that's won the lottery. If you have, hit your boy up. I got some ideas. But um, <laughs> if I were to ever win the lottery, I would keep track of that ticket. I would not wash it in the washing machine, right? I would not keep it in my vehicle. I would lock it in my safe. I would take it to a bank, right, and put it in a safe deposit box because that ticket is worth like $650 million, right? No way I'm losing that ticket. If you win the lottery, you're going to hold on to that ticket. The point of that illustration that Jesus is talking about where he's talking about the man, the man who finds a treasure buried in the field, when he talks about the man who finds this pearl of infinite value, the point of that is that they understood what they found, and they were willing to let go of everything they had to get what they knew was even more valuable. If you knew that you could get infinite wealth, but it first required you to sell everything you had, it would kind of be a no-brainer, Right? If someone's like, hey, Michael, you can have all the money in the world, but first, like, this is the price. And I'm like, I don't have that much money, but if I sold this and this and this, I'd be like, I'd sell my clothes, I'd sell my truck, I'd sell my house, I'd sell my gun collection that I may or may not have, I'd sell my baseball cards, I'd sell my, <laughs> just in case the FBI is watching, I'd sell, <laughs> lost them in a boating accident, I'd sell, <laughs> I'd sell, I'd sell everything. I'd sell everything. That initial cost is steep. It's rough. I'm giving away stuff that I'm attached to, that I like, that has been in my life for a while. But what is gained in return makes that stuff look like chump change. Right? That's the call to Christ. That cost is steep. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that following Jesus is easy or that it wouldn't cost us anything. But that's how we want to live. 
the call to follow Christ is difficult. I talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I read part of the quote where he's talking about cheap grace. But he goes on to talk about costly grace. And he says this. He says, costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. The gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and it is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. You were bought at a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Cheap grace is easy, and it sounds great for the temporary. You're telling me I can go to church and continue to do all the things that I want to do. I can say I'm a Christian and continue to do all the things I want to do. Sign me up. Hold on, wait. That's not what the call of Christ is. It's great for the temporary. Those sunglasses were okay for three or six months till they broke. But guess what? Our lives, they're not meant for just today. They're not just meant for this life. There is an eternity that we're going to have to deal with when we die. Cheap grace is great for this life, but if you want something that lasts, you've got to get the real deal. So where do we start? Where do we start? Right, If we want to move from this view of cheap grace into a life of pursuit of God, how do we move from this knockoff brand of Christianity? I think it can start with a prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, I love what David prays. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Listen to this voice, or this verse. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Point out anything in me that offends you. If we want to move into a real, genuine relationship with Christ, our daily prayer, I say daily prayer because Jesus says pick up your cross daily, our daily prayer has got to be God, point out anything in me that offends you. What do I do that disgusts you? What do I do that cheapens your grace? What do I do that minimizes what Jesus did on the cross? Point it out, rip it out, change me. Our life has to be lived this way. Some of you are going to have to change the way you do business. Some of you are going to have to change the words you use. You're going to have to change what you watch. You're going to have to change the people you're letting influence you. Your life is going to change. Why? Because we are no longer living On our own, we are letting Christ work and move through us. Galatians 2.20, excuse me, says this. It says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. I said this sermon was difficult because I kept picturing myself And I look at myself this past week, and there are definitely moments where I'm like, Michael was on display 100%. It was not Christ living through me. And some of the things I said in my attitude, right, in different areas, I'm like, that was not Christ living through me. That was me hanging on to my old life and be like, no, I'm following Jesus. I'm preaching this Sunday. I'm all good, right? That was me trying to hang on to my life. There was times I had to ask forgiveness had to swallow that pill and be like, ugh, I, ugh, this hurts. But guess what? It's Christ living in me. Man, as we look back on this past week, can we say that it has been Christ living through us or have there just been little flashes here and there? Is it us who's still living or is it Christ living in us? Have we crucified our old self? Or are we still trying to hang on? 
That real genuine brand of Christianity is one where it's no longer myself, it's no longer you, but it's Christ working and moving and evident in every area of our life. Man, what is offered in return of that price that we've got to pay is of infinite value. It's priceless. Man, are you willing to pay the price? Am I willing to pay the price of what it takes to be a genuine follower of Jesus? Let's pray. God, we come before you today. God, in our prayer, my prayer, God, is that you would search my heart that you would point out anything in me that offends you. God, whatever it is, God, root it out. God, change me. God, let my life be set apart. Let my life be holy, God, so that you can use me. God, I ask that that's our prayer as well. God, that we wouldn't settle for this knockoff brand but we would pursue the real deal. God, there's a price to be paid, yes, but what costs you much can't be cheap for us. God, I pray that we would let go of our lives and follow you, the offer of real life. I'm gonna ask a couple questions with every head bowed, no one looking around, just gonna ask a couple of questions. Man, I said that I had myself in mind as I'm speaking today as I was preparing this message and I don't know about you but simply in a moment of honesty with yourself if you would be bold enough to say you know what Michael I feel like I've kind of bought this knockoff version of Christianity I feel like I have cheapened God's grace I feel like I've seen myself living instead of Christ living in me just simply raise your hand. Is that anyone here that says, yeah, that's me? Yeah. There's a lot of us. You know what? We can't be honest. We can't pray that prayer. God, point out anything in my life that offends you unless we're honest with ourselves. Second question is this. Maybe there's some of you in here that have never started that relationship. You've never, never professed to be a Christian. And today... I am not leading you to Christ. It's God drawing you to him. But today you want to start that relationship. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. I'm going to count to three. And if you say, Michael, I need to start a relationship with Christ. On the count of three, we simply raise your hand. One, two, three. Is there anyone here that says, I need to start that relationship? I need that. If you're watching online, can let us know here's what I want if you raise your hand if you're online and you know you need this I'm gonna ask you to repeat a prayer but I want you to hang tight afterward because I want to I want to make clarify something after we pray this prayer but if you know you need to make that relationship with Jesus if you know you need um, to start that relationship I want you to repeat this prayer say Jesus thank you thank you for loving me thank you for forgiving me I know that I've sinned and I know that I've messed up and I need you to change me. Transform my heart. Forgive me. Make me a new person. Today I'm saved. Today I'm following you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, if, if you're in here and you pray that prayer, you're watching online, let me, let me clarify something. If you think that that fixed everything, then you weren't listening at all, <laughs> right? That prayer is like you throwing on a label Christian. Now it's, are you willing to pay the price? Tomorrow, are you gonna lay down your life and pick up the cross and follow Jesus? That's where the hard work comes. And so this is what we want you to do. If you prayed that prayer, if you would text the word response to 24587, and here's why we do that. We do that because like every one of us in here, we know 
that life is not easy. We know that there are questions about following Jesus. We know that there are, are, are difficulties that happen, and we want to put people around you that want to help you, that want to pick you up when you're down, that want to encourage you, that want to pray for you. And so we want to surround you with people to help push you to become all that God has called you to be. That's why we have you respond that way. For the rest of us, man, what is it, what is it gonna be for you? What's that next step? Do some of you need to get baptized? Some of you need to begin a discipleship program? Go through our FC Grow program. Some of you need to get involved, you need to serve, you need to get involved in a connect group, right? We need to stop just putting on the label and we need to start paying the price that it takes to follow God. It costs something, but what is offered in return is of infinite value. Foundation Church, we love you. Man, and as we go from here, we want you to be found people that are finding people, that are bringing people in here, that are drawing people to God because they are not seeing you, they are seeing Christ lived through you and they can't help but wonder what is going on. Man, go let Jesus shine through your lives. God, be with us. God, protect us. Keep us safe. God, let us speak out with boldness. Let us live with boldness in all that we do. God, so that your name may be made famous in everything in your kingdom expanded. It's all about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, Foundation Church, we love you. We hope you have a great week. We will see you next Sunday.